Hey everybody, it's Dr. Gilchrist, and we are continuing our journey here uh, in Drugs and Behavior for week four by talking about our different psychedelic drugs. So let's go ahead and begin. So first of all, we're going to talk about what psychedelics are. We're going to talk about different types of drugs. Uh, in particular, we're going to talk about mescaline, psilocybin, DMT, LSD, salvia, ecstasy, PCP, and ketamine. And then we're going to finish up by talking about the pharmacology of each of these drugs. So what are psychedelic drugs? Um, in general, psychedelic drugs are those types of drugs that produce reality altering experiences. So they may change uh, visual stimuli. You might potentially hallucinate. Um, you, auditory stimuli might change. You might have a very, uh, very heavy sense of empathy if you are taking something like MDMA um, or a floating sensation or a sense of dissociating from your body if you're taking something like ketamine. So the different psychedelic drugs that we're talking about can basically be broken down into three major classes. Our hallucinogens, which are the bulk of what we're going to be talking about today, mixed stimulant psychedelics, which include things like MDMA and a few other drugs, and then dissociative anesthetics, which include uh, PCP and ketamine. So what are hallucinogens? So hallucinogenic drugs are valued because of the really interesting perceptual um, or cognitive distortions that they can produce. Um, and so people really find some of these distortions to be very novel, very stimulating, maybe even spiritually enlightening. And what's really interesting about these drugs is that um, you can basically get these perceptual and cognitive distortions without producing toxic delirium. Now, many of these are going to either originally come from plant-based compounds or they are synthesized from plant-based compounds. So that these include some of the following. So these will include lysergic acid diethylamide, better known as LSD, psilocybin, which is sometimes just basically known as mushrooms, mescaline, and dimethyltryptamine or DMT. So we're gonna talk about these and other hallucinogens in a bit more detail now. So we're gonna start by talking about mescaline. So mescaline is actually found in several different species of cactus, in particular, this type of cactus right here. This is a peyote cactus or a Lophophore williamsii. And so basically what happens, the crown of the peyote cactus is cut off and it's dried, basically uh, producing what is called a mescal button or a peyote button. Now, these can be chewed raw or they can be cooked and then eaten to obtain those effects. So simply eating these peyote buttons is sufficient to get a hallucinogenic experience. Um, alternatively, we can get mescaline extracted from the cactus and then consumed uh, via a pure powder. So peyote is going to be native to the southwestern United States and the northern parts of Mexico. And there's a lot of evidence from archaeology suggesting that a lot of people in these regions um, were using peyote uh, for a few thousand years before the Spanish conquest. Um, now, pure mescaline was actually isolated from peyote um, in 19, or 1896 and was synthesized in 1919. But in general, peyote was very 
um, common for different types of healing rituals with um, indigenous uh, North Americans or in um, North Americans and people indigenous to Mexico. But the drug didn't really enter mainstream United States culture um, until Aldous Huxley uh, tried mescaline and basically um, described his experience in this book, The Doors of Perception. Um, this book and uh, the sequel book, Heaven and Hell, um, basically spawned a major rise in hallucinogenic drug use in the United States in the 1960s. Um, in fact, the band The Doors actually got their name from this Aldous Huxley title. Um, generally, it's harder to find mescaline compared to the other types of hallucinogens we're talking about because there's a very high cost to synthesizing it and there's also not really a significant amount of market demand. So next we're talking about psilocybin. Um, now there are a lot of different mushroom species that produce alkaloids that have hallucinogenic properties. So you may have heard of these as magic mushrooms or shrooms. It's also part of the reason why you don't want to randomly go into the woods and just start picking off and eating mushrooms if you don't know what they are. Um, so generally these quote unquote magical mushrooms include members of the genus Conocybe, Coplandia, Penalis, Psilocyba and Strafaria, and these are going to be found largely around the world. Um, now, typically, what you are going to find is that um, for people who enjoy using it this way, um, they may take about uh, one to five grams of dried mushrooms to obtain hallucinogenic effects. Um, you can eat the dried material raw. I have heard that's actually pretty disgusting. Um, you can also boil it in water to make tea. It can be cooked with other foods to basically cover that, that bitter flavor that people report that it has. Um, generally, the major psychoactive ingredients of these mushrooms are psilocybin and the related compound psilocin. Um, after ingestion, psilocybin is then converted into psilocin, and psilocin is the true psychoactive agent. Um, now, the use of hallucinogenic mushrooms is pretty well documented. Um, there are two different rock cave, cave paintings in Algeria, and both of them are dated to about 3500 uh, before Common Era, depicting people holding mushrooms and dancing around. Um, in Mexico and in areas like Central America, Aztec and Mayan civilizations actually developed uh, religious rituals around the eating of psilocybin containing mushrooms. Um, so this ended up um, being um, another thing that was brought up during the Spanish conquest. Um, so when the Spanish came in and conquered the Aztecs, um, they did learn about the Aztec use of hallucinogenic mushrooms, and basically the conquistadors uh, basically ended up suppressing that. Um, but they didn't exactly wipe it out. But generally, a lot of people um, in the United States really didn't know that much about hallucinogenic mushrooms until about 1938. Um, Richard Schultes uh, was a researcher at the Harvard Botanical Museum, and he basically traveled to Oaxaca, uh, Mexico, and collected different types of specimens of mushrooms that were used in rituals by the Mazatec people. And then this led Gordon Wasson to travel down to Oaxaca in 1953 and again in 1955. And during that second visit, he actually became the first known Westerner to participate in this indigenous mushroom eating ritual. Um, and this was published in an article in Life magazine in 1957 called Seeking the Magic Mushroom. And Wasson wrote uh, the following. We lay down on the mat that had been spread for us, 
but no one had any wish to sleep except the children to whom mushrooms are not served. We were never more wide awake, and the visions came whether our eyes were opened or closed. They emerged from the center of the field of vision, opening up as they came, now rushing, now slowly, at the pace that our will chose. They were in vivid color, always harmonious. They began with art motifs. Then they evolved into palaces with courts, arcades, gardens. Then I saw a mythological beast drawing a regal chariot. Later, it was as though the walls of our house had dissolved and my spirit had flown forth and I was suspended in mid-air viewing landscapes of mountains with camel caravans advancing slowly across the slopes, the mountains rising tier above tier to the very heavens. For the first time, the, world, the word ecstasy took on real meaning. For the first time, it did not mean someone else's state of mind. Now, um, somebody that's gonna become a bit more of a player with respect to LSD is Timothy Leary. Um, he was a clinical psychologist who was in uh, wanting an academic career, and he ended up reading uh, this article by Wasson, and he was really, really moved. Um, while he was vacationing in Mexico, Leary did the same mushroom ritual and basically went through a very similar transformative experience. So he had a lectureship at Harvard. He ended up coming back to Harvard and ended up founding the Harvard Psychedelic Re Drug Research Program. So basically, he wanted to basically train people to self-administer psychoactive drugs to free their minds without using doctors or institutions. So Leary and um, his uh, colleague Richard Alpert would give uh, psilocybin and later LSD to graduate students, faculty members, artists, writers, and musicians. Um, they ended up being dismissed from Harvard in 1963, but they ended up becoming very powerful leaders in the psychedelic movement and helped popularize the use of these types of drugs. So now let's talk about DMT. So diomethyltryptamine, which is also under the chemical name 5-MeO-DMT, um, these are actually found in a bunch of plants that are indigenous to South America, including uh, Brazil, Colombia, Peru, and Venezuela. And a lot of native tribes will make a uh, snuff that you will stick up your nose or what is called ayahuasca um, um, from these plants. So ayahuasca is a drink that contains uh, DMT. Um, this comes from the Quechua, Indian word meaning vine of the soul. Um, so you have to have two different types of plants for ayahuasca. Um, one, one plant are stalks from the Benis stereoopsis capi vine, and then you also need leaves from the Psychotria verdis or the Diplopterus cabrarena. Um, both of these are gonna provide DMT those leaves, the vines are going to contribute alkaloids that inhibit monoamine oxidase. Um, so interestingly, DMT is basically devoid of psychoactive properties when you take it orally, but it's when you take it in the form of ayahuasca um, that people have those effects. So the vine that I mentioned, um, that blocks monoamine oxidase, um, it helps block DMT breakdown as well, and basically allowing those hallucinogenic effects from DMT to occur. Um, so recreational users may brew their own ayahuasca, but more typically DMT is gonna be sold in a powdered form and it's gonna be smoked. And there are different uh, synthetic versions that are gaining in popularity. One of these is alpha methyltryptamine or AMT. The other is 5-methoxy dispropyl tryptamine, um, which is also known as foxy methoxy or just foxy. Um, now, foxy methoxy is going to be taken orally in tablet form. You can also crush the pills um, and either snort or smoke them. 
And then finally, we're going to talk a bit about LSD, lysergic acid diethylamide. Um, so LSD is a purely synthetic compound. So psilocybin, DMT, and um, mescaline all come from plants. But LSD is synthetic and comes from um, having a structure that is based on fungal alkaloids. So um, in 1938, it was basically synthesized from ergot. Ergot is a fungus that is used on rye, and ergot is actually pretty well known as kind of being... Um, being a compound that's used as Pitocin. Um, Pitocin is often used to trigger labor in pregnancy. So it was basically synthesized from this fungus that grew on rye. And um, one of the things that you need to know is that ergot is a very toxic material. And basically, if you eat grain that contains ergot, um, you can actually end up being very sick as a result. Um, so it was synthesized kind of based off of this. Now, LSD specifically was discovered in 1943. And as I kind of mentioned, they found that um, this this synthetic compound that was derived from ergot fungus actually had hallucinogenic properties. And so what's really interesting about all of these things is that because of this, there was this idea that LSD could be a really powerful tool to use. Um, so this is particularly true um, this is particularly true um, for a lot of government officials, particularly in 1943 when we're still in the middle of World War II. And it was believed that you could give LSD to prisoners of war to potentially get them to talk more freely because it was a bit of a mind opener. It was almost like it was a truth serum of sorts. Um, additionally, it was potentially um, tested as a chemical weapon. Um, so there, there was this idea that you could basically administer LSD to unsuspecting members of the public. Um, interestingly enough, um, the CIA actually targeted uh, people like Fidel Castro of Cuba and additionally Egyptian president at the time, Gamal Abdel Nasser. Um, no attacks ended up actually being carried out, but there was this idea that it could be a chemical weapon, that it could affect people. Um, but other people believed that LSD could be very beneficial for psychotherapy. So one of those, so we'll talk a little bit more about those different types of therapies in a moment, but particularly in the 1960s, it was researched because there was a lot of interest in chemical communication of neurotransmitters. So we're starting to find that neurons communicate with each other through the power of chemicals. And so researchers ended up finding that LSD actually uh, altered serotonin activity. And because of that, there was a lot of excitement of basically beginning to understand human behavior at a chemical level. So this was a very powerful, uh, people thought that this would be very interesting and worth studying. And so I mentioned that one of the ways that people tried to use this was to use um, this as a psychoanalytical tool. So one of these ways was what, with, what was referred to as psycholytic therapy. Um, at the time in the 1960s, this was largely done in mainland Europe. Um, and the idea was that um, you would use different types of drugs to basically open the mind or help loosen the mind. Um, so basically you would give LSD in low but increasing doses to basically promote uh, release of repressed memories and to also enhance communication with your therapist. Now in the United States, Canada, and the United Kingdom, 
there was a preference for psychedelic therapy. The patient, instead of being given these low doses, like you might see in psycholytic theory, here, we're gonna go big. We're gonna give you a really high dose of LSD with the hope that you get insight or enlightenment into yourself um, during this drug-induced spiritual experience. There were a lot of studies that were performed uh, using this type of technique to see if it could treat things like alcoholism, but one of the major problems, particularly with early psychological studies, is that there's often very poor experimental control, and because of that, you end up getting uh, inconsistent findings, and so this was largely abandoned by the 1970s. Now, I wanna talk a little bit about Project MK Ultra and Operation Midnight Climax, initiatives that our government basically um, engaged in, in um, especially uh, following World War II. So in the early 1950s, the CIA basically started a program called MK Ultra, and this was basically designed to um, see if LSD could be used as a mind control agent. So the idea is we can give this to our enemies, we can give these to prisoners of war, and we can potentially get state secrets and stuff like that. Um, so one of the things that um, was very common with MK Ultra is that um, CIA operatives would come into areas like colleges, universities, um, but basically they were trying to develop procedures that could basically weaken people and force confessions through types of brainwashing and different types of psychological torture. Um, now, LSD was only uh, one of the ways that this was done, but there were a lot of experiments on American people. Um, basically, 30 institutions and universities were involved in this experimentation program. They were testing drugs on unknowing citizens, um, and it was a pretty diverse group of people. Um, several of these tests were issuing LSD to unaware subjects in social situations, and the Army actually did this as well. Um, so the Army did this with over 1,000 American soldiers who volunteered for testing of chemical warfare experiments. Phase two had 96 volunteers that were induced with LSD to see if it could be used as an intelligence agent. And then there was a third phase with projects called Third Chance and Derby Hat um, that basically looked at 16 unwilling non-volunteers after receiving LSD and were then interrogated. So in a lot of these cases, LSD was being administered without people's consent. Um, this also included giving LSD to mental patients, prisoners, drug addicts, prostitutes, generally people who couldn't fight back. Um, as well. Um, they also did this with CIA employees, military personnel, doctors, government agents, members of the general public, um, research institutes, um, like I said, universities and things like that. Um, and Operation Midnight Climax actually ended up being an offshoot of that. Um, Operation Midnight Climax is basically um, what was done uh, the I basically these were also experiments that were done um, testing on un, unknown unwilling subjects. Um, in particular, sex workers were basically used to lure random men to safe houses in San Francisco, and they were dosed with LSD while CIA agents were observing their behavior covertly. Um, so this came to light only because people were trying to basically burn these documents. Um, and so we have a pretty horrifying history of doing these kind of things to our own citizens without their consent. And that's pretty horrifying. But let's talk a little bit more about the backlash against LSD. Obviously, finding out about programs like MKUltra um, are generally not going to bring a lot of positive press to LSD. 
Um, and basically, its popularity really started to explode in the 1960s, particularly with hippie culture and the countercultural movements. But there was going to be eventually there were going to be those backlashes, um, largely because of anecdotal um, accounts by users, adverse reactions, and also people who were researching it. So in 1965, um, a law basically restricted new research on LSD. And then basically, um, LSD was no longer administered um, for research purposes and basically recalled all of the drug that had been previously supplied to research investigators. Um, and recreational use, that should be use, not us, uh, was banned in 1967. Now, obviously, like any time that we ban a drug, it's not actually gone. It just kind of moves underground. And we're starting to see, um, we're kind of starting to see kind of a comeback, not just with LSD research um, and people who are interested looking in psychedelics. You may have heard about uh, artists or different types of celebrities who microdose psychedelics in very small amounts to, to get some additional creative spark. So let's talk a little bit about the pharmacokinetics of LSD. So LSD is largely going to be taken orally. It's going to be metabolized in the liver, and it has a half-life of approximately three hours. Now, um, now, if you compare that with something like psilocybin, psilocybin tends to have a little bit of a, um, a similar half-life. And um, so a trip from these drugs can last a really long time. Actually, I want to make sure when I make a state statement to you that it's factually accurate. Um, if you take psilocybin orally, um, your half-life is going to be about two hours. So a little bit shorter than LSD, but still a pretty long time for it to be in your system. So three half-lives of LSD is about nine hours, um, and three lives of psilocybin is still going to be about six hours. Now, LSD is pretty potent. So the drug is so potent that basically a single dose in its crystalline form is hardly going to be visible to the naked eye. So what we're going to see is that larger amounts of LSD that represent bigger doses are going to be dissolved in water and droplets that contain a single dose unit are going to be applied to a sheet of paper known as a blotter, and that's going to be dried. And then from that, the paper is divided into these tabs. Uh, you can see an LSD tab with Bart Simpson on it. These are often going to be very colorful, and they're going to be sold as single dose tabs to basically be swallowed by the user. Um, so this has some really interesting implications because a Occasionally, you will hear um, an urban legend. One of the more common ones is a blue star tattoo that's being given out that might be laced with LSD. When I was growing up, I remember when I was in eighth or when I was eight years old in 1990, hearing an announcement from my principal about LSD being present on stickers. And I would like to remind you that very similar to the PSAs that we saw in section one, drug dealers are not going around trying to get kids hooked on drugs. It is a very bad business proposition. Additionally, there is no evidence that people have been giving out LSD lace stickers to unsuspecting people. So if you hear about blue star tattoos or stickers or temporary tattoos that have been laced with LSD, be skeptical and look up Snopes. Okay, so we're going to finish with our final hallucinogen, salvia or salvinorin A. Um, so this is a member of the mint family. As you can see, it has very mint-like leaves. And it is native to Oaxaca, um, the same region where um, Gordon Wasson basically found out about hallucinogenic mushrooms. In fact, um, 
the plant's psychoactive properties were first reported by Albert Hoffman, who discovered LSD, and Gordon Wasson. Um, and these were also historically used in uh, religious rituals um, by Mazatec shamans. And then it later um, became kind of a recreational substance in uh, Western areas of the United States. Um, so when I first taught this class, salvia was a drug of concern. This may have changed since that time. I can tell you it is banned in Missouri. Now, the leaves can be chewed. Um, the extracts can be smoked. Generally, you're not going to get a lot of psychoactive effects by swallowing salvia because the uh, critical component, salvinorin A, um, is really inactivated in the gastrointestinal tract. Um, but what we find is that if you have the extract, which contains salvinorin A, that extract can be smoked. That will get disabled if you chew the leaves. Um, but it's going to be very quickly and effectively absorbed uh, through the lungs if it's smoked. And thus, it's been reported to have uh, vivid hallucinations, out-of-body experiences, and it's going to look really similar to LSD and uh, other hallucinogens. Now, let's talk a little bit about the pharmacology of these hallucinogens. So let's start with the general overview. So one of the first things that we know is that the potency of different types of hallucinogens vary. But we do know this much. LSD is going to be the most potent hallucinogen. Mescaline is often going to be the least potent. Um, now, depending on the dose, and when you last ate, because that will potentially affect how quickly the drug is absorbed. Remember that food in the stomach slows down absorption. Um, depending on the dose, um, the psychedelic effects will typically begin within 30 minutes to an hour and a half after you ingest. Um, now, an LSD or a mescaline trip can last between six to 12 hours or even longer. Um, psilocybin trips can be a little shorter than LSD or mescaline. Um, now compare that to something like DMT or salvia. Um, part of the reason people smoke DMT is because basically the, the effects of those substances, because both of them are typically smoked, they're gonna, they're gonna feel, you're gonna feel the effects of those within seconds. They're gonna peak over the next few minutes and they're typically going to be gone an hour after you smoked those drugs. So here you can see some different common routes of administration and the varying potencies. Now, try as much as possible to kind of keep in the milligram range because we have most of these in the milligram range, but LSD and salvia are also in that microgram range. So for a basis of comparison, try to stick to the milligrams to get a better idea. So most of these are going to have oral roots, um, but DMT and salvia are more commonly smoked. Now, when we're talking about LSD trips in particular, and we're gonna spend most of our time talking about LSD, um, and I would also say that with psilocybin, you do get similar effects. Um, other hallucinogens are going to have different response profiles, but the core effects are largely going to stay similar across drugs. So typically, um, the reason that we call it a trip is because you're kind of going somewhere that's different from your normal conscious awareness. So the trip can basically be divided into four different stages. So we have the trip onset. This is typically going to occur 50 or 30 minutes to an hour after taking LSD. 
And you're going to experience visual effects like intensification of colors, um, geometric patterns, objects that you can still see with your eyes closed. And then uh, the next two hours are basically what are known as the plateau phase. Um, during this time, the subjective sense of time does tend to slow down a little bit and the visual effects really begin to intensify. The peak phase um, begins after three hours and it's gonna last for another two to three hours. And basically during this time, a user might feel like they're in another world where time has been suspended. There might be a continuous stream of bizarre, distorted images. You may experience synesthesia where colors can be heard or sounds can be felt. And then finally, that peak is going to be followed by a come down, which basically lasts about two hours or more, um, depending on how much you took. Most of the drug effects are going to be gone by the end of the come down, but the user may not feel normal until the next day. Um, so hallucinogenic drugs produce a wide variety of different psychological changes. And this may include feelings of depersonalization, emotional shifting. Maybe you start euphoric, but later you're anxious and fearful, and there might be a disruption of logical thought. So, you may have heard people talk about a good trip or a bad trip. Uh, this is an image from uh, Walk Hard, the Dewey Cox story, uh, kind of an off-color comedy making fun of music biopics. Uh, the main character goes on a trip, LSD trip, with the Beatles. So here you can see the trippy cartoon Beatles. Um, so a hallucinogenic trip can maybe, uh, it's typically a good trip when it feels like it's very spiritual spiritually enlightening, but it typically is going to be a bad trip it's a, if it's disturbing or frightening. Now, whether or not somebody has a good trip or a bad trip depends on a few different things. Obviously, it's going to depend on the dose. You probably are not going to get a really bad, scary trip if you're microdosing, for example. Um, the individual's personality traits, uh, their expectations, and previous drug experiences. If you're a really anxious person, this may be a really hard drug to take for you. Um, additionally, the physical and social settings also play a role, but here's the really scary part. You can't predict in advance whether or not you're gonna have a good trip or a bad trip. So how do people who research LSD uh, rate these different subjective effects? And what they actually look at is what is called the Altered States of Consciousness or ASC rating scale. Um, and they basically have uh, five different dimensions. So they have uh, oceanic boundlessness, which kind of relates to feeling like nothing is real and loss of ego boundaries. And that kind of corresponds to the mystical positive experiences that people feel with the drug. They feel a sense of unity. Uh, the ego disint disintegration anxiety um, includes things like drug-induced thought disorders, negative emotional responses to the loss of ego boundaries. So it's if you're experiencing a bad trip, you're gonna be pretty high in this one. Uh, visionary restructuralization um, kind of relates to distortions of visual perception, like illusions, hallucinations, uh, synesthesia. And then the last two dimensions um, are reduced vigilance, so basically lack of paying attention, and auditory alterations, like hallucinations. These do not occur with all hallucinogenic drugs, um, and they're going to be considered less important items on that scale. So um, here you can kind of see an example of dose-dependent subjective effects of psilocybin using this scale. And so you can kind of see here that um, you get a really interesting dose-dependent response um, for oceanic boundlessness, ego disintegration anxiety, and visionary restructuralization. 
And you can kind of see here with this profile, particularly with the larger doses, that psilocybin produces a pretty solid sense of oceanic boundlessness and a little bit of um, visual and especially um, very strong visual restructuralization. So you can kind of see that there's a lot of reports of imagery, synesthesia, visual alterations. There's a little bit of a sense of disembodiment and impaired control, not so much anxiety, strong blissful state with an experience of unity, and a pretty powerful sense of insightfulness. Um, and you can kind of see that these three things, so our oceanic boundlessness, ego disintegration anxiety, ego disintegration anxiety, and the um, visionary restructuralization um, have been subdivided to help provide more information about different drug-specific reactions and dosage-specific reactions. Now, what are some of the different physiological effects of the hallucinogens? So LSD in particular can give rise to uh, activation of the sympathetic nervous system. So you are gonna get pupil dilation, you're gonna get an increase in heart rate, blood pressure, and body temperature. Um, LSD use um, can lead to dizziness, nausea, and vomiting. But this is going to be more likely to occur with things like peyote or mushrooms. Now, something kind of interesting, I haven't really shown you the chemical structure of all of these drugs yet. As you can kind of see, most of them resemble serotonin in their structure. So here is 5-HT, 5-hydroxytryptamine. That is our serotonin. Now, here we have DMT. Here we have LSD, and in particular, note that the highlighted structure looks very much like serotonin. Here is 5-methoxy or foxy-methoxy, which is a synthetic version of DMT. Here is, um, here you can see uh, psilocin, and then we have a slightly different group that's added to create psilocybin. So these are sometimes referred to as the indolamine-like hallucinogens. They look like serotonin. So that includes LSD, psilocybin, psilocin, DMT, methoxy, and synthetic tryptamines. Now, mescaline is actually more similar to norepinephrine and amphetamine, in particular phenol, uh, bleh, I cannot pronounce today, phenolphthalamine. Um, and so these are sometimes referred to as the phenolphthalamine-like hallucinogens. Um, and mescaline is one of those. And then salvinorin A is kind of the wild card. Um, so salvinorin A doesn't really look like any of the others that we've talked about. Um, chemically, this is what is known as a, neuro, a neoclaridane diterpene. So this one's going to be a little bit different. Now, most hallucinogens are going to be serotonin agonists. They enhance the effects of serotonin. Um, so, for example, LSD actually binds to eight different serotonin receptor subtypes. Um, in particular, it responds to 5-HT1A, 1B, 1D, 2A, 2C, 5A, 6, and 7. And mescaline actually binds to a few of those as well. Um, now, we aren't exactly sure what caused all of the different effects, but we do know that it's action at the serotonin receptors 2A and 2C that seem to produce hallucinations, particularly um, in areas um, in areas of the um, these areas ultimately um, are going to be our sense of reality, the prefrontal cortex and the cingulate cortex. And what we find is that um, by interacting with these serotonin receptors, they inhibit 
areas of the prefrontal and cingulate cortex so that you can experience those hallucinogens and experience those hallucinations and you can kind of feel like they're real. Now, the serotonin 2A receptor really seems to be critical here. So researchers have found, ah, um, the researchers have found that hallucinations do tend to be blocked by receptor antagonists. So here we've got, um, we've got a few different things that I'm going to kind of orient you to. So PLA is our placebo. K1 is ketanserin, which is a receptor antagonist. Um, K2 is a uh, K2 is a very similar dose. So K1 is 20 milligrams. K2 is a larger dose. Um, here, psi is psilocybin. Here. We have two different dosages of risperdone. Again, this is going to be another antagonist. And then also haloperidol. So what you can kind of see here, these participants received um, oral psilocybin or they received a placebo. And then they completed the altered states of consciousness rating scale. In particular, they were focusing on that visual component. Um, now, they were also pre-treated with a placebo, ketanserin, risperdone, or haloperidol. So they were testing visionary restructuralization, looking for those hallucinations. Um, in all cases, psilocybin increased um, those visual restructural, visionary restructuralization scores compared with the placebos. Now, these increases, so here, we have a group that gets a placebo and psilocybin. And you can see here, we get a lot of hallucinations. Those will become blocked with ketanserin. They get blocked and reduced with risperdone. And they also get blocked with haloperidol, although to a lesser extent. So haloperidol doesn't really seem to be effective. And it really shouldn't because haloperidol affects dopamine, not serotonin receptors. So we can see here that the serotonin 2A receptor seems to be really critical for producing those hallucinogenic effects. Now, again, salvia is going to be different. Salvinorin A is an opioid agonist, particularly of the kappa receptor, and we don't really know that much else. So what effects do hallucinogens besides salvia have on the brain? So I mentioned that the prefrontal cortex really seems to be critical here for our sense of reality. So here you can see a, a neuron in the brainstem, a serotonin neuron. And here we have, we have our hallucinogens. Here, acting on deep cortical layers. And here we have a 2A receptor. And here we have layer five of the prefrontal cortex. And again, hallucinogens are enhancing those effects. So what's happening here is that hallucinogens are going to excite those serotonin 2A receptors. And that enhances glutamate release. And because it enhances that glutamate release, it actually interferes with filtering of sensory information. It turns out that our brain has a gating circuit with the thalamus, the prefrontal cortex, and the striatum to let us know if the thing that we are seeing in front of us is real or not. And what's basically happening is that the hallucinogens basically effectively block that gating circuit. As a result, we see things, but that gating circuit is not in place to say, this is coming from the drug I take, it's not real. So we lose that gating circuit. Now, one of the things that's kind of interesting, and this is something that's coming up a lot, you can develop a dependence with things like marijuana. You can develop a dependence with things like caffeine. And typically those don't feel as addictive, but they can be. Hallucinogens though are different. They're not addictive per se. They don't really produce significant withdrawal symptoms. 
after chronic use, and they're not reinforcing in animal studies. Animals do not self-administer. However, even though we don't think that they're really addictive, you can develop a dependence on hallucinogens if you are exposed early on in life. Um, most of them will produce a rapid tolerance due to downregulation of serotonin receptors. So if you take a lot of hallucinogens, the serotonin receptors are ultimately gonna cut their numbers. Um, and again, DMT, and salvia, again, are going to be exceptions to this because they're smoked. And additionally, they have really rapid, fast-acting effects. Now, let's talk a little bit about the potentially serious negative effects that can happen. And of course, um, we have to talk about the bad trip. Basically, during a bad trip, uh, a user is going to experience an anxiety or a panic reaction in response to the drug effects. They might be related to an interaction between the drug, your emotional state going into the trip, and the external environment. Now, generally, anytime that you are on a hallucinogen, it's very common talk to have what's called a babysitter, somebody who has experience with these drugs and can help talk somebody out of a bad trip. But if it's unsuccessful, you might actually have to take the person to the emergency room for treatment. Now, data from older clinical studies of LSD administration do suggest that bad trips are rare when users are pre-screened for emotional stability and the environmental conditions are very carefully controlled. So if you're a very neurotic person, this may not be for you. Now, another complication can be flashbacks um, where people re-experience hallucinations. Um, in fact, um, if this occurs for a long time after prior, prior drug use and they're really starting to cause impairments, we actually call this um, persisting perception disorder. Um, we don't really know about the prevalence of this disorder. Um, there aren't a lot of documented cases of this. Um, and then finally, the most severe reaction is going to be a psychotic reaction. Now, um, People who were really against hallucinogens will argue that this is the biggest risk factor um, of taking these, but generally um, psychotic episodes are going to happen with people who had already been diagnosed with disorders like schizophrenia or they were manifesting pre-psychotic symptoms before they took that drug. But there are exceptions. Um, News, news stories have kind of noted a case of um, an 18-year-old German woman who smoked a joint thinking it was marijuana, but it had actually been spiked with salvia leaves, and she, uh, she'd never taken salvia before, and she ended up being admitted to emer the emergency room because she was suffering from uh, agitation, disorientation, disorganized behavior, uh, and hallucinations, and ended up developing life-threatening somatic symptoms. And these actually continued for a while, and she did eventually get discharged in stable conditions, so that is something to be aware of. Now, let's talk a little bit about some of the different brain areas that we know can be affected by hallucinogens. So we have the visual cortex. Um, this is gonna alter visual processes. We have areas like the temporal cortex um, into, um, kind of the midline of the brain. Um, it's going to increase activity in this area. Again, visual processing. We're gonna get increased sensory signals to the prefrontal cortex. The locus coeruleus, which again has a major, um, it's a major producer of noradrenergic cells, norepinephrine. Um, and you're going to um, basically uh, have decreasing that spontaneous activity. And then the prefrontal cortex with that release of glutamate, it is going to increase its activity, but it's going to basically make those hallucinations seem real. So now let's talk about mixed stimulant psychedelics. And in particular, we're gonna talk about MDMA.
Now, multiple times I have referred to MDMA as ecstasy. And this is one of the things that we really have to be careful about. MDMA and ecstasy do not always mean the same thing. Ecstasy can actually refer to any number of stimulants that may have very small amounts of MDMA or none at all. Uh, your book kind of notes this. Um, so these drugs are going to have properties of psychostimulants like amphetamine, but also hallucinogenic properties. So that includes MDMA and then the synthetic versions of salvia, AMD, and methoxy or foxy methoxy. Now, I want to talk more about the history of MDMA. Um, we've already kind of talked about salvinorin A, and so talking about those synthetic versions, you can learn more about those by learning about salvia. Um, MDMA was originally discovered in 1914, um, and ultimately it, it was basically the reason that it was discovered was to basically find amphetamine derivatives, and it started to be used uh, recreationally in the 1970s. Your book notes that it's what's called um, an empathogen. Um, and one of the things that people who take MDMA really note is that they feel a lot of things. And so because of that, it's often used for uh, psychotherapeutic purposes. It was temporarily listed as Schedule 1 in 1985 and was moved there permanently in 1988. Now, let's kind of talk about some of the different pharmacokinetics. So um, it has an oral administration. It's typically going to be taken in pill form. And it has a peak concentration within two hours of administration. And it's going to be metabolized in the liver with the uh, active metabolite, oh boy, methylene dioxyamphetamine. There we go. I know I could do it. And as you can see, compared to the uh, hallucinogens that we talked about, it has a relatively long half-life of approximately nine hours. It is going to stay in your system for a pretty long time. Now, Ser MDMA has effects on both serotonin and dopamine, and that's because it looks like a hallucinogen and it looks like um, it looks like an amphetamine. And uh, one of the things that we know with serotonin is that um, MDMA basically um, keeps, it, it works very similarly to how amphetamines do with dopamine. So basically it does two different things. Um, it causes serotonin reuptake transporters to pump in reverse. And additionally, it prevents storage of serotonin into vesicles. So what we can see is that more and more serotonin is going to be pumped into the synapse, particularly with those higher doses. So you can see that serotonin isn't in the vesicles, and by getting those reuptake transporters to pump in reverse, you're going to get more serotonin into the synaptic cleft. Now, it also can enhance dopamine, but that's really only going to be true at very high levels. And part of the reason that it does this is um, it is going to uh, produce very similar reactions um, with dopamine. So it's going to increase dopamine by not storing it in vesicles. And again, like amphetamines, causing those dopamine reuptake transporters to pump in reverse. So again, we're going to have more dopamine in the synaptic cleft. But this effect is going to be stronger for serotonin than it is for dopamine. So really, we're only going to get that enhanced dopaminergic effect in high doses of MDMA. Now, one of the other things that we know is that MDMA is very damaging to serotonin cells. So this comes directly from your textbook. This is four days of MDMA administration in monkeys. So they basically got MDMA over a period of four days. And basically what you can see, um, all of these. So here we have um, initial. So we have initial serotonin. Here's two weeks after treatment. Here's seven years after treatment. And uh, what you can see um, 
the left panels, this is our placebo group. So you can see here that even just a few days of MDMA causes severe damage to serotonergic cells. And even if you stop taking it several years later, you do not have a complete recovery of uh, ser serotonergic neurons. Now, a couple of other things that we know about MDMA, because it is a psychostimulant, it does affect heart rate. So you can see here, it does increase heart rate, particularly at higher doses. It can increase our um, subjective energy levels, again, particularly at higher doses. And it also creates heightened sentences. And this is even true at low doses. But there are some adverse effects that can happen. Um, we already talked about persisting perception disorder with our hallucinogens like LSD, and that's also possible with MDMA. Um, additionally, there can be psychotic episodes, particularly if other drugs are being taken uh, at the same time. And additionally, um, MDMA causes a lot of high body temperature. If you are in a rave situation where there are a lot of crowd crowds and bodies against you, that's going to raise your body temperature even further. And if you are not well hydrated, you will experience potentially unconsciousness and multiple organ failure. Um, and again, there is going to be a rebound effect. So you can kind of see here's acute administration of a high dose of MDMA. Basically, 24 hours after, no serotonin and dopamine is really present. And that's going to cause some not so fun withdrawal effects. One other thing that I want to mention before I move on is that MDMA has been used and considered as a potential treatment for PTSD. Researcher, researchers have suggested that part of the reason why MDMA is often uh, beneficial for PTSD is kind of, again, this mind opening thing. A lot of people who have post-traumatic stress disorder really spend a lot of time trying to resist the events that basically cause their trauma, trying to avoid those memories. MDMA and the help of a really good therapist can potentially make that resistance less likely, which gives somebody a greater likelihood of, um, of um, recovering. And you can see here, so here we have our clinician assisted PTSD scale, and you can see that there's clearly a difference here uh, with treatment. And this was reported in a 2011 study. So we're going to finish up by talking about our dissociative anesthetics. We're going to talk about PCP and ketamine. This section is going to definitely be shorter than the others. So let's first take a look at the chemical structure of these drugs. As you can see here, they do have some similarities. Now, what is PCP? So fencyclidine or PCP was originally developed as an anesthetic in the 1950s. Um, and it basically produced a very unusual anesthesia. Um, per subjects that were given PCP weren't responsive to painful stimuli, um, but they also weren't in a very relaxed state of unconsciousness. They were in this trance-like or catatonic state, um, and they were either very rigid or they had this waxy flexibility that you would see in people who were catatonic. Um, what was notable about this, it did not produce respiratory depression that you see with barbiturates. And um, one of the other um, major problems with this um, is that a lot of people had really severe reactions. Um, some people became very agitated when taking PCP for anesthesia, um, and it also induced post-operative reactions like blurred vision, dizziness, disorientation, um, hallucinations, severe agitation, and even violence. And as a result, um, it was no longer used as a clinical anesthetic since 1965. Um, 
PCP did eventually find its way into a lot of different cities where it was dubbed the peace pill. Um, and by the mid 1970s, it had new street names like Angel Dust and Hog. Now, what's interesting is that despite the fact that it is an illicit drug, it's never been as widely used as marijuana, cocaine, or heroin in general. Now, ketamine was developed as a safer alternative to PCP. Um, it was less potent. It was shorter acting. Um, and it is a valuable anesthetic for certain types of medical procedures, particularly in kids, because it's short-lived. And it's also used as a sedating and immobilizing agent in with uh, veterinarians. Part of the reason that sometimes you'll hear people refer to ketamine as a horse tranquilizer. And it's largely marketed under the trade names Ketalar, Ketaset, and Vatilar. Now, there are some common routes of administration here. PCP is usually going to be obtained in powdered or pill form. Um, it can be ingested by any common route of administration. It can be taken orally. It can be snorted. It can be injected intravenously or intramuscularly. And additionally, there are some PCP users um, that will apply the drug to uh, cigarettes, marijuana, um, for the purposes of smoking. Now, ketamine usually is going to come from diverting materials or theft of materials from medical um, centers or from veterinarians. Ketamine is typically going to be marketed as an injectable liquid, but uh, if it's on the streets, it's usually going to be evaporated to yield powder that's either going to be snorted or it is going to be um, compressed into a pill form. Now, what are some of the different subjective effects of PCP? Users will report feeling a detachment from their body, uh, a floating or vertigo sensation, um, numbness, and a dreamy state. And researchers have also found that it affects mood too. People report either feeling drowsy, feeling apathy, loneliness, negative affect, and yet others report feeling uh, euphoria or a drunk-like feeling. And one of the things that's kind of interesting is that PCP use resembles a lot of the disorganized cognition that you will often see in disorders like schizophrenia. They have difficulty concentrating or focusing. Uh, they have difficulties with abstract thinking and their speech is often very halted. Now, the subjective effects of ketamine are going to be pretty similar in this regard, um, and you can kind of see a table of these as well. Um, so often these are going to look really similar to PCP in low doses, but higher doses will produce um, what is referred to as a dissociative anesthesia, where um, higher doses um, people are going to lose all mental contact with their environment, despite the fact that their eyes are open and they still have muscle tone. Individuals may feel separated from their body, floating above um, and looking down at themselves like a near-death experience, um, which is sometimes referred to as the K-hole. Depending on who you're talking to, the K-hole is either going to be really spiritually uplifting or it's going to be really terrifying. Now, interestingly enough, in terms of its pharmacological effects, both PCP and ketamine are non-competitive antagonists of our NMDA receptors. So NMDA receptors, just as a reminder, are ionotropic receptors for glutamate. When glutamate binds, sodium and calcium can enter a neuron and exert a variety of different cellular effects. One of the things that we noted previously with NMDA, if you've had me for biopsychology, there's a magnesium block, but one of the things you may not have known, there's a binding site for PCP. And if PCP or ketamine binds to this site, um, basically, 
glutamate is unable to bind. And what researchers have found is that um, researchers have basically found that in animal studies, this can actually produce different types of cognitive deficits, particularly in areas that are highly NMDA receptor dependent, like the hippocampus and the cortex. And this may actually produce memory problems. Now, both ketamine and PCP are reinforcing, and they have been, uh, this has been demonstrated in self-administration studies with animals, indicating that there's very high abuse potential. And they do activate cell firing of dopaminergic cells in the midbrain, and we get a significant dopaminergic release onto areas of the prefrontal cortex. Um, the data here actually comes from human subjects, so you are looking at IV administration of ketamine. So subjects who had never used ketamine before were either given um, a placebo, they were given um, kind of a moderate dose, or, or they were given a small dose, which is 0.4 milligrams, or a heavier dose. And you can see that the lower dose produced a significantly high desire for the drug 80 minutes after using, and also very high liking of the drug. But notice that even at both dosages, they're both rating higher than the placebo. What are some of the different effects of chronic use? Uh, one of the things that we know is that this can produce uh, urinary uh, problems such as bladder pain and incontinence because this directly affects release in the prefrontal cortex and it also affects the hippocampus. There have been uh, different types of cognitive deficits and memory problems and these can persist even after a period of abstinence of the drug. Um, ketamine users also do experience more delusional thinking than people who don't use. And additionally, researchers have found evidence for both gray matter and white matter abnormalities in the brain. So folks, that is it uh, for talking about the hallucinogens. I will join you next time to talk about inhalants and GHB.